It's important to bear in mind why to this day we refer to these sorts of weapons as firearms. You know, gunpowder doesn't just magically go off when you pull the trigger, you have to set fire to it. Now pretty much every firearm invented after the matchlock has the means of creating the fire that it needs at the moment that it needs it. This weapon does not, and so you've got to carry your fire around with you. Now, of course, from a modern perspective, that likely seems like a bit of an inconvenience. Uh, but if you think about it, you know what better way to set off gunpowder uh, than to shove burning rope into it, right? <laughs> That's the way the weapon works. Very simple operating system. I'll show you all the moving parts. Yay! That's all of them. <laughs> trigger there operates that curved arm called a serpentine. You squeeze the, tr squeeze the trigger and it swings the serpentine and that is it. That's all that thing does. All the serpentine does is hold on to one of those burning ends of match so that when you squeeze the trigger, you lower that burning cord directly into the pan, which of course when the weapon is loaded is filled with gunpowder. Very crude, obviously, but its simplicity helps to make it pretty reliable. There's just so little going on there that there's not a whole lot to go wrong. And again, just about every time you stick burning rope into gunpowder, Chances are pretty good something's going to go bang. In the hands of a trained musketeer, a weapon like this one is going to give you an effective range of about 100 yards, which basically mm. means up to a football field away. You would be expected to be able to hit who you're aiming at most of the time. At that range, weapon's not necessarily going to give you a tremendous amount of precision. You may not know what part of your adversary you're going to hit, uh, but it tends not to matter. This is a weapon engineered for use on the battlefields of Europe against both heavy infantry and cavalry, which means it is meant for shooting through plate armor. It is meant for bringing down war horses, both which are a little bit taller order than just taking the plain old human off the battlefield. Armors shared the battlefields of Europe with gunpowder for the better part of two centuries, and what you are trying to shoot through is now bullet-resistant armor, which is why muskets have been developed as a beefed-up version of earlier firearms to provide the additional firepower necessary to get through newer generation armor. And any time you've got an animal as substantial as a horse in a high-stress environment like a battlefield with its adrenaline up, it's going to take a lot to stop it. But that's what these weapons are engineered for. Now, there's no real standardization at the time. They vary quite a bit. But in English service, in order to be considered a musket and not some lesser class of firearm, they figured the weapon needed to be, needed to be firing at minimum a twelfth of a pound of lead per shot. Puts it in the neighborhood of 75 caliber, so a three quarter inch wide ounce and a third of lead or bigger. That's going to exit that weapon thanks to the length of the barrel moving close to the speed of sound neighborhood of 800 to a thousand feet per second and when you've got that kind of mass moving at that kind of velocity you've got sufficient kinetic energy to reliably pierce or mangle most any conventional armor in use in the time period and will reliably drop a horse over those first hundred yards so we come back to shooting at an enemy soldier you hit, you uh you hit a 200 pound animal with something that'll drop a 1200 pound animal does it really matter all that much what part of him you hit? No. No. Probably not. Right? <laughs> Chances are pretty good he's out of the fight at the very least. So it's an effective weapon without being highly precise. A trained musketeer is also expected to be able to load and fire his weapon twice in a minute, two aimed rounds in a minute. Uh, which, given everything you have to do to prepare the weapon for the next shot's moving pretty quick, but it's not a high rate of fire, which is why this is very much a teamwork-oriented weapon. You want to go out with a big group of people so that you can take turns firing at the enemy and protect each other as you're reloading. Most commonly, in English service at this time, they're going to use what they're going to call a, a close order formation. Keep everybody close together in an ordered and organized fashion. Not the long, thin lines that you'll see in later centuries. At this time, it's going to be a block about as deep as they are broad. So you've got lots of rows, lots of ranks of soldiers, and those ranks are going to rotate as they fire, kind of a constant assembly line. As that front rank fires and begins to reload, a rear rank coming up to replace it. Guys who've already finished reloading, constantly coming back to the front of the formation. This is going to allow the group as a whole to fire quite rapidly, while each individual is only firing once or twice a minute. Going to give everybody the time they need to reload and protection while doing so. So teamwork is absolutely going to be key for making this an effective weapon system. Now the ammunition for reloading most commonly going to be carried here in the bandolier. And we're going to go ahead and get it ready to fire again. Talk about the process as we do it this time so you can see what all of this does. First step is going to be to prime the pan at the rear of the weapon. The priming powder carried in the flask. We're going to use a little bit of that powder to fill the pan. Close the pan cover so the powder stays put. Make sure there's no excess powder outside the pan that can cause the weapon to go off early. Cast it about. Each one of these little wooden bottles called chargers is going to carry just enough gunpowder to propel one bullet measured out ahead of time so you don't have to stop and measure on the battlefield. Just pop the top off and empty that powder right on down the barrel. The bullets themselves 
are going to be carried in the pouch on the hip. Now, of course, for our demonstrations today, using an actual bullet in the middle of a modern museum would represent a certain amount of hazard. So what we're going to be using today is a paper ball instead of a lead one, but that projectile is going to go right in on top of the powder. The scouring stick is used to push that projectile to the breech, seat it tightly against the gunpowder, return the scouring stick, recover the weapon, make sure that match is burning nice and hot, fix it into the serpentine, check to make sure it's going to land in the correct position, and now all we have to do is open the pan, exposing the powder, aim the weapon and squeeze the trigger, lowering the match into the powder. What we're going to do is fire this round, load and fire a second round without explaining anything, just to give you an idea as to how much time is actually likely to elapse between two shots on the battlefield. Again, bearing in mind that fighting is part of a company, multiple other ranks of soldiers are going to take their turn firing between your two shots. Again, this does tend to be a little on the loud side, so if you don't care for loud noises, you may wish to cover your ears. Present your pace! Ready or pace! Mm -hmm. 